Well, he was a sweet boy. <laughs> yeah, he was, um, he was just a, a kind soul and um, very sweet. He loved his brothers and his sister, and, but he loved to um, ride his dirt bike. And you no, know, just his regular bike. It wasn't a motorized dirt bike, but a regular bike. And he loved to do tricks and he loved to ride a skateboard. Those were his favorite things growing up. Zachary played basketball. He loved that. But they were always outside playing and riding bikes and playing with the neighbor kids. And... He never got in trouble with the law, but he, you know, I think he had the good morals and values that, you know, he was raised with, but he didn't, um, you know, he was just following in the wrong crowd and making poor choices. Well, he continued to use marijuana. I mean, he he continued to use marijuana through high school, you know, after he graduated. And his girlfriend, who was really, really nice, um, decided that Zachary wasn't maturing. So they broke up, which was devastating for Zach. And then he met another girl. And that's when Zachary went down the path of using heroin. And he did that for 11 months. And then we got him into rehab. And he was clean without drugs for three years and did well, but that relationship was not good. And then she started to hold the baby from him. And so he wasn't allowed to see the baby. And I think that that was hard on him, and one day he just used again. And then that's when he overdosed. So there's three different ways they talk about with the present opioid overdose crisis we're in. The first one was from prescription drugs as a direct probably link back to the prescribing. Uh, the second one was a heroin uh, wave and the third is a synthetic opioids that we're in right now. And the original um, wave, the first one, I think you can really link that to the amount of opioids that were prescribed. Looking at a study, um, it was within the last decade, but they found that of people that abused prescription opioids, only 4% went on to use heroin. Um, and initially, about of heroin abusers, about 80% had a history of using prescription drugs as abuse. A um, couple years later, it was 60%. And now, I believe, there are people that are going directly to heroin or synthetic opioids that never use prescription drugs. And you see that much more commonly. And so the link is still there potentially, but it's not as direct as what it used to be. Some people say that the opioid epidemic as we know it right now started in 1999. Opioids are very helpful for people that have acute pain that's you know very overwhelming. Unfortunately, what happened historically was that um, the medical industry was under the impression that the risk of addiction was very low with, with opioids. I mean, there's a big dichotomy from what we were taught in medical school, which is, you know, you basically prescribe with no limits, um, and that's what was felt to be ethically appropriate at the time. And on the other hand, when you focus on a, this issue from a community perspective, it really changes the way that you approach um, chronic pain management. It's obviously um, destroyed the community. I mean, it's destroyed lives in this community. Um, the drug trafficking is a huge problem, um, you know, and it just continues. And um, families are losing their loved ones. And then along with the drug trafficking comes the violent crimes, the shootings, the stabbings, the, those, you know, 
thefts. Uh, people are stealing to support their, find funding to support their habits. Um, and it's, um, it's just an ongoing, you know, battle. Um, probably within the last 10 years, I would say, uh, it's, there's been that upward trend. Um, in two, 2020, we had, I think, 39 drug deaths that year. Um, you know, with COVID, everything was shut down, but clearly there was plenty of um, drugs to be found, you know, uh, in our community. You do need help because it's not something you can just say, just stop, you know. And Zachary knew that too, because Zachary would research it. He would show me articles about it. How do you detox? How do you stop? Because he didn't want to be addicted. He was highly embarrassed about it. He would cry about it. He would research it. He would, you know, show me the information on it. And, you know, he would, he just didn't want to live that lifestyle. The first script I got, it was supposed, I know I got 60 pills, I believe it was. Um, and like the the bottle was supposed to last me a month, so it was a month script. And I'd remember I ate all of the pills within a three day span, and that was my first exposure to opiates. Like I had zero tolerance to opiates. Like I was strictly smoking some weed, drinking pretty heavy, and doing cocaine pretty heavy. So that just shows like I can't say for certain if I was like born an addict. Um, I don't know if it was more of a progression thing as I kind of was introduced to certain substances, but I do know thing that is like very conclusively true in my case is like, I just have the inability to flip the switch off. Like once the first one goes in me, I want more and more and more and more. And that was like the story of opiates, much with everything else. But the shelf life that I had after I was introduced to opiates and being able to keep my life somewhat manageable, that shelf life quickly dissipated. Um, and it just, I mean, things were falling apart left and right after I was introduced to opiates. I'm uh, Corporal Mitch McMunn. Uh, I'm the supervisor of the Troop F Vice Narcotics Unit. We basically cover nine counties within central Pennsylvania, and we mostly focus on illicit drug trade. Yeah, Williamsport in central Pennsylvania is kind of a microcosm of uh, the Philadelphia area because most of our drugs come from, from that area. I mean, small portions come from other areas, but uh, I think probably around 2008 to 2010, we really started seeing a transition uh, to heroin. It started to become really cheap and really uh, predominant in the area. I kind of equate our national drug problem to like a, uh, a building or your home's water system. Uh, we have, you know, our area is just one piece of that water system. So if we have a leak in our kitchen, uh, what's the best way to, to take care of that leak? It'd be to shut off the, the main valve to quit, to stop having water come into the entire house and then fix that little problem. We we're trying to fix the problem with the water main still on. So you're, it's, you're kind of slowing it down, but you're not stopping it. You're always working up the chain, you know? And what I mean by that is, if we arrest somebody for possession, you know, you try to find out where they're getting it from and where that product is coming from. And it just, it's a snowball effect until it gets back to that source city. And it's not always easy to do because, you know, obviously investigations, there's, you know, we got to abide by the constitution and, you know, search and seizure laws, obviously. So it makes it difficult sometimes because when we're dealing with, with those that are, are partaking in the drug trade and, and distributing it illegally, we, uh, they, they learn what our tactics are and what we're doing. So. Um, it's kind of a cat and mouse game to a degree. So we're always trying to catch the source and trying to go up the chain. Um, so that might start here in the city, go up, and then we use some other agencies from the state. You, know, you have some of the state agencies, which would be Pennsylvania State Police. You have the Attorney General's Office. And then we try to go up to the federal level, uh, working with FBI, DEA, and, and institutions like that. So. I think one of the big misconceptions maybe is 
Um, some people uh, tend to be ignorant to what really is here, you know, and how much of it is here. You know, I think a lot of people sometimes will sit there and look, well, that doesn't happen here. That's not here. It is. You know, the reality is, it is that it is here, um, and it's very easily accessible, unfortunately. I truly believe we realize kind of when it's already too late how bad things are. I could be starving um, in a desert, famished, and if you told me here's money for drugs or here's money for food and water, I would literally pick drugs every single time. I'm a criminal, I'm a thief, con artist, manipulator. Um, I'll basically, I, the fact of the matter is I'm literally willing to do anything to secure my next high. Um, it could be as simple as just stealing a check, you know, cashing a bad check, or it could be, you know, mean something much more severe, like, you know, um, you know, physically hurting somebody, you know, that's the thing is like, once you're in the grips, everything that you were taught and everything that you had grown up having instilled in you completely goes out the window. Um, you put, you put drugs into me and I'm a monster. Um, and that's, you know, it, it's cliche, but like, that's just like the fat, it's a sad fact. Like there's nothing like you cannot, there's nothing you could bring to me during my active addiction, like, hey, you need to do this and able to get high today. There's nothing I would say no to. Um, everything, everything is in play, um, and, and I'm, I'm literally willing to do anything for the next one. I want to say it was the early 2010s that we really started to see a shift. And then it was, and that's why I was, I was trying to rack my brain to think if it was 2013 or 2014 when we were, the city was really being, city of Williamsport was really being overrun with um, opioid um, concerns to the point where the then mayor had said that the, the judge should impanel a grand jury to address this need. And that's when the um, heroin task force actually started. I mean, we were having really dealing with a lot of opioid or excuse me, heroin overdoses and not knowing how to address that situation. So that was when Shay Madden and I basically together decided, all right, let's see what we can do, and began those series of meetings throughout the county to bring everybody's awareness to where this, pro where this problem was coming from and give people in a gentle way ways to help them understand how to discourage it, and but also help support those individuals who were seeking treatment. You always want people to recognize the problem of substance use disorder. Like you always want people to know it's actually, it's a real issue and it can hit any one of you. But we weren't there. And then one morning I'm driving to work, I remember this, and all of a sudden we were on the front page of the paper. Like that, the issue, the addiction issue, substance use disorder issue was front page, front and center. And I remember thinking, I always wanted us to be there so that people would recognize this issue. But once we got there, it was like, okay, what we had to do to get here wasn't so great. People were dying and more people started to pay attention because of those people that were dying and they were young and they were, you know, some of them very vibrant members of the community that you wouldn't, you know, that people don't expect because people, a lot of people still have in their mind, it's like one type of person becomes addicted to a substance. I remember telling myself for months, every night before I go to bed, tomorrow's gonna to be the day. We're not getting high tomorrow. Um, and it was a complete lie to myself because I think every single day, if I had the monetary means to do so, I would get high. But that's like, it's one thing to like, still be on the cusp of like, eh, are you ready to like, stop this living kind of lifestyle? It's another thing to not want to be in this lifestyle at all. You actually despise getting high because you're not really getting high anymore. 
Um, you're barely just doing enough to get on E and to live like somewhat a normal life, just to function. And like, that's like the epitome of hopelessness when you don't even want to get high anymore, but like, it's always going to be the final outcome. There's no getting way around that. And the true turning point would, would when, I, when I got arrested. I didn't stop using drugs and alcohol because I wanted to. Um, the first thing, I only stopped in the beginning because I wanted the negative consequences to stop. Because originally I was thinking it's not just a Philadelphia problem, it's an everywhere problem. Um, and how I know that is because of my relationship with West Branch Drug and Alcohol Abuse Commission in knowing what their statistics are. In, and I wanna say it was several years ago, they identified that the, the typical client that they see is white, they're local, they're not from out of county, and they're in that age range of maybe 18 to 30 in that area. And so it has become a national problem. So you can't put a finger to this city or this region, it's, it's endemic. Getting a prescription for opioids changed, it was not like it had been. So what, you know, what do you do? Um, fentanyl was easily made, it's very cheap. Um, you only need a very little bit of it. So that's what we started to see because we, you know, there was the heroin, but then it, a lot of pills, pills were kind of the thing. Um, and then again, that gets clamped down on, which is great. But at the same time, like, is anybody thinking about what's gonna happen to all of these folks that are on those pills and physically addicted to them? Um, they're going to turn to something else. You can't just chop this off and, and no repercussions. Maybe closer to 2017 timeframe, we start seeing a lot more fentanyl, and then it, it just kind of has taken off and it, and it has replaced heroin, which is a calculated move. It, it's been a business move uh, to source out or, or to, to phase out heroin and move to fentanyl by the drug cartels. Fentanyl is very much still in my county. Uh, and when we talk about fentanyl, we're talking about heroin. All heroin being sold in Lycoming County, it is fentanyl. It has been since 2018. We're also seeing with some regularity, uh, opioid, opioid based prescription painkillers uh, being sold on the streets that contain fentanyl. Uh, dealers are acquiring like a pill punch and uh, they'll add dye coloring and fentanyl uh, to this mixture and they will punch out pills that oftentimes look like Oxycontin or Percocets. And they'll sell these pressed fentanyl pills on the streets as Oxycontin or Percocets. Unbeknownst to users, the, the heroin that was being brought here was laced with carfentanil. So what happened is, is, is people, the users would use their usual dose, think it was just heroin, and then it ended up being laced with carfentanil, which is much more potent. And then that was the reason for all the falling out and all the overdoses that were occurring. So people didn't realize that they were getting, they were ingesting or injecting themselves with carfentanil. It just takes such a small amount of fentanyl to put somebody down compared to what we administer. I mean, we use, you know, fentanyl um, in the, for my nursing role. We use fentanyl. It's a great drug when it's used properly. You know, for somebody who has serious trauma. Um, fentanyl is a good drug to manage, you know, fractures and pain from those things. But, but when it's packaged in, you know, street form, um, it can be deadly with even a small amount. It's kind of all over the place. Sometimes we see just fentanyl toxicity. Sometimes we see fentanyl, heroin, cocaine, gabapentin. Then sometimes it's mixed with the prescription drugs, benzos. Um, you know, gabapentin um, is used to potentiate the effects of the narcotics. So we're seeing that showing up on a lot of the toxicology reports. Um, I, we've seen as many as 10, 12 different substances in some of these tox reports. 
what's most alarming right now uh, is the presence of xylazine in controlled substances. Uh, xylazine is a powerful tranquilizer, not meant to be ingested by humans. Uh, xylazine depresses the heart rate and the blood pressure in humans to dangerous levels. The effects of opioids can oftentimes be combated with the use of Narcan. Persons suffering from the effects of xylazine cannot have those effects reversed by administering Narcan alone. I don't think opioids will ever go completely away, um, especially on the medical side of things, because I think they do have they do have a purpose for people. Um, I, you know, that is such a hard question for me, and everybody always wants the answer to that, and what's the success rate and all this kind of stuff. Um, I always go back to stigma, because I feel like until we sort of work through some of that, we're not going to solve things. And, and I don't think there's ever gonna be just one big answer that resolves all of these issues like we're, we're going to have this but it can look different and it can look better um, it is destroying families and people's lives um, you know you've heard we, there was a 12 year old a couple of weeks ago as a parent i cannot imagine that I cannot imagine that that's what that's where we're at and that's what things have gotten to Yes, the drug is, is what is in the person's body, but it is, it is the stigma of what happens with folks and the trauma that people have gone through in their lives. People don't want to be addicted to substances. And I get crazy when I hear people say that. I mean, that is not the life that they want. Both chronic pain and addiction are very isolating diseases, and they're also completely underserved. And so um, if you have chronic pain or you have a family member with chronic pain, realize that it is very hard for them to maintain relationships because they're unable to do the things they enjoy. Uh, often they struggle with depression as well. It's so important to, to maintain relationships with people in those situations. And addiction is the same way. It's really a classic disease that breaks relationship. And so um, reaching out to your friends that have addiction, trying to maintain a relationship within certain boundaries, because I know it's difficult, but try to be there so if they ever do want to seek out help, they know who to reach out to. It's really important. Many of the individuals I've worked with started using alcohol, drugs, at a very young age because they felt in some way that was the only way they could manage what they were going through. Whether it was physical, sexual, emotional abuse, whatever it is, we've got so much trauma in the people that we see in the criminal justice system. And so when you've adapted your life around coping with difficult circumstances by using something that takes you out of your body, essentially, it's really hard to let that go and to deal with the emotions. I remember an individual spoke at our, one of our recent graduations from treatment court and he said, feeling feelings is horrible, but I've learned that once that they, they're not gonna kill me and they last for maybe about 90 seconds and I come out the other side. And once I continue to do that and I practice that, then it reminds me that I don't need drugs or alcohol to get through it that I can do this. And every day that I do is another day where I'm that much further away from using and from not having to look over my shoulder. So, um, so education, I think, is always going to be number one in my book. It doesn't matter to me that I lost my son by an overdose or I lost my son in a car accident or I, you know, how I lost my son. I'm in pain every day because I lost my child, you know. I mean, is it hurtful because he overdosed? Yes, but it's, it would be hurtful because he was in a car accident and died, you know. But, um, you know, I think people need to be educated about, you know, drugs too. Kids need to be educated about drugs and what it can do. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about Zach. You know, I think about him every day.
we shouldn't have to bury our children. They're, they're horrific situations all the time, and there's nothing I can say to do to change that. I mean, um, so that's why I, you know, involved in prevention, and you know, I try to, you know, help with hoping to get people the help that they need before they end up being another statistic in the office. If, if I can keep that one bag of heroin or that bag of crack or whatever drug it is that we're dealing with, if I can intercept it and keep it from going into some young kid's body, you know, keep them from ingesting it and then, you know, they go on and, and do good things in their life. Because I got to believe that's happening, you know. So when I you look at it that sense, I, I think we make a difference in, in certain people's lives. Maybe the overall making a dent in it, but you know, not quite sure. But if we can make a dent or an impact in somebody's life and get them on the right, the right track, then it's all worth it. I just want people to know that there's help available and that there is hope. We have, at this point, a good quarter of our staff are in long-term recovery. Like, that's amazing. That's amazing. So when people ask me success rate, I don't have any stats, but what I can say is, you know, you know, here's our staff and, and look at them because many of them have come through all of these programs that we're talking about and are, are now working here, which is like the coolest thing ever. It's like we're either moving back towards a bottle or we're moving further away from the bottle. And like progression can move at a snail's pace. You just gotta be moving in the right direction. So just knowing the intensive work that it's going to take from the day you truly decide to make that step in towards your recovery journey and knowing the work that's going to need to be done and it's not going to look pretty at times and um, life can still be quite unfair at times but um, just knowing that there's better days ahead. <laughs>